So Bitcoin is often thought to be secure as long as 51% of the mining power is honest. But this assumes that all parties see all valid blocks and transactions. Bitcoin relies on its peer-to-peer -peer network to deliver this information. Um, so if you control the peer-to-peer -peer network, you can control the flow of information within Bitcoin and thereby control the blockchain. Uh, in this talk, we're going to attack the peer-to-peer -peer network and use information eclipsing to subvert Bitcoin security. So first I'm going to tell you what an eclipse attack is and the bad things you can do with an eclipse attack. Um, then I'm going to show you how you can perform an eclipse attack, um, how you can get into position to perform a, an eclipse attack on the peer-to-peer -peer network, and how many, um, and the resources necessary to do this. And then finally, I'll discuss um, our countermeasures and their deployment in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So before I tell you what an eclipse attack is, um, I have to explain a little bit about the Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network. So these are nodes in the peer-to-peer -peer network, and we're gonna be looking at the purple node. Um, and by default, nodes make eight outgoing TCP connections. The direction of the arrow is the direction of the TCP connection. Um, and there are uh, nodes allow up to 117 incoming TCP connections. Um, these, these connections, these edges, are used to uh, gossip transactions and blocks, where blocks are um, a special type of aggregation of transactions. Um, and for blocks, I'm using this uh, blue um, square icon. And so you can see that uh, someone discovers a block and they spread it through the network and the blocks flow um, across these edges and they can flow in both directions. So uh, our attack is only going to look at um, nodes that accept incoming connections. Um, uh, not all nodes accept incoming connections. Uh, some wallets, some nodes behind NATs do not accept incoming connections. So what is an eclipse attack? Well, um, in information eclipsing, if you manage to gain control over a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, over a node in a peer-to-peer's network's access to information, um, you have uh, eclipsed it. So for example, if the purple nodes, all of their connections were to um, attackers that sort of conspired against it, um, they could deny, um, they could prevent it from learning about that block being sent around, and they could also tell it things which, um, uh, which it couldn't tell any, any other part of the network. Um, and so normally attackers are not in this position. So what I'm gonna talk about later is how attackers can get into this position. But before I do that, I want to explain why, why this is so bad to once a node has been eclipsed. Um, and we can redraw that picture so the attacker is sitting in the middle between the um, purple node and the rest of the network. But this doesn't mean the attacker is an uh, on-path attacker. Um, it just means that all of the purple node's connections are to the attacker, so the attacker can decide what the purple node sees. So what bad things can you do if you eclipse a node? Well, um, you can perform a 51% attack with less than 50% of the mining power. So in this case, we have an attacker that is 40% of the mining power. We have the, the purple node is also a miner with 30%. And the rest of the network has 30%. The rest of the network is drawn by this cloud. Um, and we're going to represent each party's view of the blockchain up here. The attack hasn't started yet, so they all see the blue block. Um, the first thing the attacker does is it partitions the network so that um, the, the two other parties can't build on each other's blocks. Um, the attacker can then uh, outcompete uh, each, each miner individually. So because the attacker is 40% of the mining power, it'll generate a longer blockchain than the purple node. Um, Bitcoin always uses the longest blockchain, um, and it can perform the same attack against the rest of the network. So the attacker's uh, blockchain will become the consensus chain. Oh, um, this is, this is uh, equivalent to a 51% attack because the, because the attacker can ensure only the attacker's blocks are added to the blockchain. So the attacker could choose not to include any transactions in the blockchain and Bitcoin would just stop working. Or the attacker could use this to go undo history in the blockchain um, and, and lots of other bad things. Uh, now into the, this attack, we assume the attacker not only had eclipsing power, but also had mining power. Um, there are some other attacks uh, that can be improved with mining power. For example, we can do an improved selfish mining attack, but I'm not gonna talk about that here. Um, so now let's look at a situation in which the attacker does not have any mining power. Um, and we've added a merchant to this picture. 
and the merchant and the, the purple miner are going to share the same view of the blockchain. Now, the attacker wants to do a double spend. So, oh, yes, the purple node has 30% of the mining power. The rest of the network has 70%. So the attacker double spends a transaction. Um, the, this transaction gives coin, coin zero to the merchant. And then there's a separate double spend transaction that gives coin zero back to the attacker. Um, the attacker has partitioned the network. Um, and because both the miner and the merchant see the same thing, the, the miner includes the, this transaction in a block and then confirms it and mines blocks on top of that. Um, and the same thing happens with the, the rest of the network. The rest of the network sees the transaction, includes it, and starts building blocks. Um, uh, but neither side knows that the other blockchain exists. So the merchant has no idea that the transaction has been double spent due to the partition. And the uh, merchant has no idea that there is an existing longer blockchain. So the merchant releases its goods to the attacker. Um, and then the attacker starts relaying blocks again. And all of a sudden, this blockchain is no longer valid. It's, uh, it's thrown away. The, merchant's, the transaction to the merchant is thrown away, and the attacker gets the money back. So the merchant thought they saw a transaction. The merchant, in fact, did see a transaction confirmed in this example by three blocks. So the merchant thought it was safe. But because of the uh, eclipsing, the merchant was unaware that it was unsafe, and the attacker was able to perform double spending. So this attack didn't use, didn't, this attacker didn't have any mining power. It co-opted a third party's mining power. And in our paper, we have some uh, other no mining power um, eclipsing attacks. Um, so now I'm going to explain how you get in this position to perform this, this attack. So normally, an, attacker's, uh, an attacker that joins the network to attack the purple node um, is not necessarily going to be um, connected to by the purple node. So the attacker needs to manipulate the purple node such that the purple node will make outgoing connections to it. Um, so the attacker fills the, the, the purple node's peer tables with attacker IPs. And I'll explain how peer tables work in the next slide. Um, the node then restarts and loses its outgoing connections. And then when the node goes to draw on its peer tables to make new connections, because they've been filled with attacker IPs, it will connect to the attacker. Um, so how do these peer tables work? Well, each node uh, picks its peers from two tables. The new table stores IPs that the peer is, um, uh, has heard about but not connected to. And the tried table um, has IPs that the node has peered with at some point in the past but may not be a current peer. Um, these tables uh, contain buckets, and inside the buckets, there are IP addresses. We represent honest, um, honest IPs by, these, by the green circle. Um, the tables also store a timestamp for each IP. Um, I won't go into uh, how timestamps work for the new table, because it's not important to our attack. But in the tried table, the timestamp is the last time that node connected to, um, connected to our node, so the last time this IP address connected to the node. So if a node wants to make an outgoing connection, it, it's going to use these IPs. The first thing it decides is whether it's going to choose from the new or tried table. Once it's selected a table, it selects an IP address from in the table. Um, this selection is biased towards fresher, more recent timestamps. Um, and then it attempts an outgoing connection to that IP address. So what the attacker wants to do is just fill these tables up with attacker IPs represented by the red circles um, so that when it goes to choose an IP address, it has no choice but to choose attacker IPs. Um, furthermore, the attacker can, can tilt the game in their favor um, by ensuring that their IPs are always the freshest IPs. So how does the attacker actually get IPs into these tables? Well, um, whenever a node makes a connection to another node, it gets its IP in the tried table of that node. Um, furthermore, once a connection has been established, um, a node can uh, announce additional IPs, and those go in the new table. Now, I drew it with four dots, but you could imagine this with, um, well, in actual practice, these messages can contain up to 1,000 IPs, and you can send multiple messages. So filling the new table is, is trivial, and we won't talk about it in this attack. It's much harder to fill the, the tried table, and so that's what, the, the, that, that's what we're going to focus on. Um, and then the attacker can just repeat this, and for each node under its control, um, for each IP address that it controls, it gets an additional IP into the, the tried table. Uh, 
Um, and then the attacker waits for the node to restart. Um, once the node has uh, restarted, um, when it goes to select new outgoing connections, because it's filled the, the, the tried new table, these connections will be to attacker IPs. Um, and so the attacker has eclipsed all outgoing connections. But remember that I said these nodes also have incoming connections. So how do we do this? Well, it's actually really simple. You can make 117 connections from the same IP. So you can just fill up all the incoming connection slots on a node and eclipse it. Um, so how easy are these restarts? Is it, is it practical? Um, how can this happen? The attacker needs these restarts. Um, well, we all know there's like a day of the week in which you patch your computer. So attackers could, could plan around that um, or could wait for that to happen. Also, there's critical security vulnerabilities that are released that the victim either needs to patch or, um, or you know, it's lose-lose for the victim. Uh, there's been several uh, denial of service and packets of death CVEs in um, Bitcoin and many more in the underlying OSs. Um, and uh, one study said that within about 10 hours, a Bitcoin node has, a public Bitcoin node has about a 25% chance of going offline. Um, and then finally, the security of Bitcoin's peer-to-peer -peer network should not rely on 100% node uptime. So the attack isn't as, as easy as just filling the tried table. There's one complicating detail, and it's the reason for these buckets. So an IP address is, is, is going to be sent to tried. And what Bitcoin does is it breaks the IP address into two pieces. The first part is called the group. It's the slash 16 prefix of the um, IP. And the second part is, um, is just the second part of the IP. Uh, we, we hash the group to four buckets, so it chooses four buckets. Um, and then the, the second part of the IP chooses one of those buckets for the, um, for the address to be placed in. Now, this actually makes the attack more difficult. Imagine you have a whole bunch of contiguous IP addresses. Um, uh, many of them, if they're within the same group, which they're uh, likely to be, unless it's an enormous amount of contiguous IP addresses, they'll be within the same slash 16. You're only going to be able to fill those four buckets. Um, so this either requires massive numbers of IP addresses, um, or it requires that you have a botnet that has sufficient IP diversity. Um, in our paper, we consider both scenarios, but in this, we're just going to look at. Um, but in this talk, we're just going to look at botnets. Um, so, what do you do? You're an attacker. You have a limited number of IP addresses. Um, the more IP addresses you have, the better off it is. The more IP addresses in distinct groups, the fewer IP address honest IPs in the tried table, the better as well, because um, you have you have less to compete with. Um, and we've already showed that you have this selection bias that you can exploit to get more bang for your buck for your IPs. But also notice that the selection bias, if you, if you make the honest IPs more stale, it helps you as well. And so what you can do is you can just run the attack for longer. If the honest IPs all have timestamps from one hour ago and you run the attack for five hours, now they're six hours stale. Um, so you basically have two resources, the number of IP addresses you have and the time invested in the attack. Um, so it actually gets worse. There's some other things the attacker can exploit. Um, so these buckets only hold 64 IP addresses. So if we have a bucket that's full that has um, 64 IP addresses in it, um, and a new IP is going to be hashed to that bucket, um, it needs to evict something. And so the Bitcoin eviction routine is to randomly select four IPs, to delete the oldest IP, um, and then to insert the new IP in its place. This gives the attacker two, two additional places, uh, two additional vulnerabilities. Because the selection process is, is random, the attacker, um, if the attacker evicts one of their own IP addresses, they can just rerun that IP address and potentially evict an honest one. So they can just uh, improve their chances by, by trying over and over again. Um, additionally, uh, as we've already discussed, the attacker can ensure they're the most fresh, so if there's if one of the four is an honest IP, the attacker can basically ensure that the honest IP will be evicted. Um, so we've explained uh, how to do this, but, but who can do this? Um, how easy is this to do? So our approach was to um, look at the Bitcoin source code and model it with probability analysis, and then um, also use Monte Carlo simulations to validate, this, um, to validate our probability analysis. Um, we use these models to determine effective attack parameters, time invested, number of distinct IPs, um, and then we experimentally verified these parameters against uh, live Bitcoin nodes. We did these to our own Bitcoin nodes, but they were part of the, the Bitcoin network. 
Um, so we, we ran several experiments, but, uh, um, but I'm only going to tell you about two. The first experiment was a worst case experiment. So we wanted to see how an attacker could um, win like all the time, no matter what was in the tried table. So we artificially filled the nodes tried table with um, honest IPs, uh, and these had the freshest timestamps of just before the attack. Our model predicted we needed about 4,800 IPs with two IPs per group, and about five hours invested in the attack. Um, after the attack, the nodes tried table was almost completely filled with attacker IPs. Um, and we performed this experiment 50 times. And in, in each time, the um, attacker was able to eclipse all eight outgoing um, connections uh, for a 100% success rate. Um, and this is, you know, when we look at botnet sizes, this is, this is clearly a pretty small botnet. Um, botnets have both the diversity and numbers far in excess of this. So the second experiment we ran was we wanted to, um, we wanted to see well, like what, how would this work against a realistic non-worst case node. So we, we had some Bitcoin nodes. We connected them to the network for about 43 plus days. Um, the node that we're going to look at had um, a tried table of around 300 honest IPs, so it was not full at all. Um, and so based on this, we determined a botnet of around 400 IPs should be sufficient um, investing one hour. And while the tried table was still empty at the attack, uh, after the attack, um, a majority of the IPs were attacker IPs. Um, and we got an 84% 84, 84 success rate. So uh, ran the experiment 50 times, and at each time, all eight outgoing connections um, were eclipsed. And um, we looked at the, the, the Karna botnet because its IPs have been published. Um, and if you were to randomly sample uh, 1,250 IPs from the Karna, you would get the group diversity on average. So just shrink a subset of uh, Karna, and you'd have enough groups to perform this attack. Um, so we developed some countermeasures. Um, the first countermeasure we came up with uh, thinks about this vulnerability. We have a vulnerability towards selecting fresher, fresher timestamps. Um, so if we just randomize the selection process, that vulnerability goes away. Um, an additional vulnerability we face is this um, is eviction bias, where the oldest uh, IP addresses are evicted. Um, and then we also have this uh, additional vulnerability of try, try again, in which um, uh, you can improve your chances by just, if you evict yourself, you can run it again and then hope not to evict yourself and continually um, improve your chances. Um, and what this looks like, uh, we have a, we, we, we graph this, and so the y-axis is number of IPs that, you, that the attacker gets in the tried table, how full the attacker gets the tried table. This um, uh, line here is, is the tried table being completely full. And so you can see it's actually fairly linear. For about 4,000 IP addresses, you get nearly 4,000 IP addresses in the tried table. Um, so we propose a countermeasure of deterministic random eviction. Um, in which not only do IP addresses map to buckets, but they deterministically map to positions within those buckets, um, evicting whatever happens to be in that position. Um, this removes both of those vulnerabilities, and we get a much nicer line. So to get close to what under Bitcoin eviction took about 4,000 IP addresses, you'd need more than 10,000 IP addresses. Uh, an additional problem we face is that in our realistic scenario, the tried table filled up very slowly, um, so we have uh, feeler connections. A feeler connection um, takes IPs from new, verifies that they are in fact online Bitcoin nodes, and then it adds those IPs to the tried table to fill up the tried table. Um, another problem is that you know, uh, good honest IPs are evicted from the um, tried table. Uh, so we have a test before evict. Um, we test IPs in the tried table. If they're online, we don't evict them. Um, we actually borrowed this from Storm bot, uh, the Storm Botnet's uh, anti-peer poisoning system. Um, so we told the Bitcoin developers about our attack, and they were, they were awesome and took really quick action. They implemented uh, countermeasures 1, 2, and 3 in Bitcoin 0.10.1, which has 30% public node deployment, right? 60% uh, public node deployment right now, or last time I checked. Um, but we felt that feeler and test before evict were also very important countermeasures. 
Um, so we implemented these in a patch, and it's uh, currently awaiting review. Um, how effective are these countermeasures? Well, the countermeasures that are currently deployed in the worst case scenario with a full tried table, raise it from about um, 4,600 IPs to 41,000 IPs with a attacker success rate of a coin flip. Um, in the live node setting, they increase it by almost a factor of 10 um, with a uh, lower attacker success rate. Um, and in worst case with, with our patch, test before evict is really helpful because if you have all honest, um, if your tried table is filled with honest IPs, um, then the attacker can't push, uh, push any of them out because they'll, they'll all be online. So if you're in a safe state, you tend to stay in a safe state. Um, we analyze this in more detail, assuming churn of honest IPs in our paper. Um, and feeler connections actually prevent us from talking about uh, the live realistic node setting because the tried table is going to fill up more, uh, fill up much quicker. So it's it's better than than this. It probably is moving this more to a worst case, but we have to perform more experiments to um, to uh, discuss it in detail. So one objection is that this is really bad. The peer-to-peer -peer network is vulnerable. Uh, maybe miners shouldn't connect to the peer-to-peer -peer network at all and only connect to trusted parties. Um, but how do you decide who to trust? Uh, major mining pools have engaged in things which are uh, less than honest behavior. Um, and if you did create some trusted club of networks, how do you let new people in? How do you determine uh, who to trust? And how do you prevent this from becoming like a centralized um, uh, club? Uh, so. Our goal was to make Bitcoin robust to peer-to-peer -peer attacks while preserving the decentralization that's at the heart of Bitcoin. Um, so in summary, uh, Eclipse attacks violate Bitcoin's core security guarantees. Um, these attacks are practical. Even a very small botnet can um, pull them off against realistic uh, 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 Bitcoin nodes. Um, and we currently have uh, countermeasures to resist these, and, and some of these countermeasures are already uh, deployed and protecting Bitcoin. Really nice work. Um, Thanks. I'm, I'm curious uh, why Bitcoin originally decided to do this complicated uh, buckets and try to do versus a random selection that seems to be uh, superior to that. What was their thinking there? So I can't, I can't, I can't speak to their, their, their thinking because I don't know their thinking. I, uh, looking at the code, what I imagine their thinking was, was that they wanted to ensure that nodes that you just recently heard about that were more likely to be online um, would, uh, would be more likely to be chosen. Um, but they actually really liked this countermeasure. It simplified their code base. And so they, uh, they, they, they tested it and adopted it um, and felt that it was uh, superior to the previous behavior. Hi, Grady Clark, Rutgers University. Um, I'm wondering, I have two questions. So why did the Bitcoin developers only decide to do, what is it, one, two, and six, and not the try before evict? And who are the main targets of this type of attack? So are mining pools open? Because from what I understand is, I might be wrong, they represent a single node that tries many things. So this is, these are the two questions. Thank you. All right, uh, let, me, let me answer your um, first question. Uh, the countermeasures one, two, and six were just uh, really easy wins. They reduced the number of lines of code. Um, they were simpler. There was less things that the attacker could use to game the system. Um, so, and there was very little um, uh, risk in sort of, sort of code changes. They were just making code simpler. Um, the feeler connections and test before a VIC um, involved uh, larger architecturing. The, the patch that we have is, is much bigger and requires much more um, testing. Um, we've performed a lot of tests on it, uh, and hopefully we can get it deployed. But that, that's the reason that they chose um, 1, 2, and 6. Uh, and they were able to bang it out amazingly quickly. Um, the issue in terms of who would be targeted, um, yes, miners use gateways. Um, and if miners uh, relied purely on the peer-to-peer -peer network, they would be vulnerable to these um, attacks. Uh, we didn't do a survey of miners to determine um, who was vulnerable and who is not. Um, 
but you could also attack merchants with this. You could attack wallets if you were doing some sort of like local Bitcoin. Well, if you were doing some sort of Bitcoin transaction with a person, you could do this. And we know, in fact, that um, uh, someone did a on-path uh, eclipse attack um, at a carnival, and they did this to make um, things run faster. They had a very slow uplink, and people were buying things at the carnival with Bitcoin. So they just like hijacked every, everyone's connection, sent it through one node, and then had that node use the, the slow uplink to the rest of the Bitcoin network. Um, Hi, uh, Matt Kindy from Rice University. Um, was there any consideration of using uh, node age in the sense of a sort of node contribution to the blockchain as a consideration for including IPs inside so that relatively new uh, users that were more likely to be attackers could be prevented from being in the try tables? So if I understand your question. You're, um, you're asking if we could use, we could determine nodes which have been around a long time and have contributed to Bitcoin Correct. and use that as a trustworthiness. Yes. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's a great idea. Um, currently in Bitcoin, nodes are not associated with uh, blocks being produced. Right. Um, but if you did have a mechanism for this, uh, it would be very good to to look at the age of someone and say, well, like this person has long term been um, been uh, been known as honest, right, uh, exactly a right. reputation system. Mm -hmm. uh, but Bitcoin nodes don't actually have any cryptographic proof of identity, and they some of them switch IP addresses quite frequently. Right. So it would be a little bit difficult to do with Bitcoin, but you could like layer something on top. Thank you.